Mesici. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please join me in praying the prayer for illumination wholeheartedly together. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. In the midst of the multitude of words in our daily lives, speak your eternal word to us, that we may respond to your precious promises with faithfulness, service, and love. Amen. The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. morning and uh, happy MSF Sunday. Also happy 30th anniversary uh, to the MSF. Huh? I'm uh, glad to be here, humbled to have this opportunity to speak on MSF Sunday. Um, but also I have a bit of trepidation because usually preachers for MSF Sunday are uh, of a certain age, right? They have white hair, maybe also less hair, eyes. I'm underage. <laughs> I'm not qualified yet to be MSM members, I'm maybe associate members. <clears throat> and I still have hairs, uh, but not as thick as before. Uh. So, um, so if I you know, do say things that's out of turn, that may be a bit offensive to the seniors, please uh, uh, be gracious and be kind and uh, accept my apology. Uh. Um, let me open with a short one. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Your word uh, cleanses us, your word uh, renews us, uh, make us fit for eternity. Uh, grant us now ears to hear uh, what you have to say to each one of us, uh, whether we are old or young. Uh, may the meditation in our hearts this morning be pleasing to you. Amen. When I was um, about 10 years old, I think standard four, primary four. I joined the school chess club. And also I joined the it's a school uh, competition, chess competition, it's a friendly chess competition. Now I just started to pick up chess, so I wasn't very good, right? And, um, and I began to lose, you know, as I, I was paired with, a, with someone also my age, because he's also no better. Uh, but as I was playing, I began to lose uh, my, you know, the high value chess pieces, you know, the knights, the bishops, the queens, until I was left mostly with pawns, and of course kings, uh, the kings cannot be, cannot die in this day. So I was uh, left mostly with pawns, and I, I found myself stuck. I didn't know what else to do. And I remember there was no timer, and so I was stuck for a while, not able to move, not able to make the decisions what to do with you know, my remaining pieces. I was thinking maybe, oh no, I made a mistake a few steps ago, why shouldn't I done this, why shouldn't I you know, done that? And so I was stuck for quite a while, and the teacher in charge of the club, also my class teacher, Mr. Thomas Lee, he noticed, and he came over and asked me, what's the problem? You know, and I told him that, uh, sir, I, I don't know what to do. So he looked at my remaining chess pieces and then he gave me this tip. He said, if you don't know what to do, just advance your pawn. Just keep moving. Just keep moving forward. And that's a very helpful chess tip uh, that enabled me to continue playing 
and I move upon. And I think it's not only just a very helpful tip for playing chess, uh, it's also a helpful tip uh, for living, you know, a helpful life's lesson. Especially when we find ourselves stuck in life for some reasons, you know, we, we are not able to advance, we are unable to move forward, you know, we are, you know perhaps we are chained to the past, right? Uh, chained to the past, trapped by past relationships, by bad memories, failures, temptations, sins. Uh, perhaps we despair over the future, you know, that we're thinking about our lives and not being spent in such a way as to leave a sense of legacy that we may not have achieved as much as we can and, you know, that's all we can do now. So there is a sense of, you know, uh, stuck, right? And instead of living fully in the present, we live partially up to a point. But Jesus says this, right, that, um, that he came so that we may have life and have it to the full. And now this promise is not just for the young and the able, you know, those full of life and hope, huh? it is for the seniors as well, those advancing in age. And more so because uh, this later stage of life, or in some circles it's called the third age, that's the 60s and above, yeah, the first stage is 0 to 30, second age is 30 to 60, and uh, the third age is the 60s and above. This time can be a time of uh, challenge, uh, particular struggles that uh, young people won't know until they face them personally, experience it for themselves. Uh, struggles and that older people face often sometimes in silence, like the loss of power, you know, physical ability, cognitive ability, you know, possible illness, or health conditions, or maybe the loss of relationships, of connections. You know, friends, colleagues become fewer, uh, family members visit less often, you know, they have their own lives to live, and you know, perhaps loved ones, you know, gone forever. And of course, there's also the loss of significance, right? We may be successful once in our working days, but after retirement, you know, we become ordinary person. And the young ones will know us. They will know what we did. You know, they might even see you know, old people as you know, the feeble, you know, need a lot of help, the burden, you know, a problem to be solved. And so the challenge to live fully uh, for the seniors and those advancing in age is uh, pressing because time, there's only so much time. How to live our remaining years well and with purpose, with dignity, with a sense of you know, self-worth. And I believe it's a question not just for the seniors, uh, but also for the youngs, uh, especially those of us who are, you know, heading in that direction, the, the, those who will become the third age uh, in, in good time. Now, our text this morning, uh, taken from Philippians, it offers us uh, the way of wisdom, right? Forget what's behind. Press on. Look forward to what's ahead. Now, these are not empty words uh, crafted to impress. Uh, these, are, these words have weight. They are born out of Paul's experience, Paul's life. And you know, by the time he wrote these words, uh, or he wrote Philippians, uh, he, he's not a young man anymore. Uh. He's, you know, probably in his uh, 50s, 60s, you know, uh, 60s, you know, considered young maybe in our time, but he's uh, considered an aged man in his time. And he has lived through, you know, that case, you know, the first half as a persecutor of the church and the second half as a defender of faith. And, um, and he, wrote, he, he gave us these this wonderful words and uh, the scripture. And I'd like to share just three uh, insights uh, based on uh, what he wrote uh, in Philippians, uh, in this particular verse, verse 13. And the first is essentially this, uh, that, um, you know, uh, forget, forget what's behind. Now, I, if you know your Bible, you know the Bible does talk a lot about forgetting, right? In fact, there are some things uh, we are asked to forget, don't remember. Then there are some things we are asked to remember, don't forget, right? Which is which, you know? Of course, the context matters, huh? because in, in, this, in this particular context, Paul, uh, he wanted the Philippian Christians to live a new, their new life in Christ, you know, to keep growing in faith and not held back, you know, not held back by their past. Right, and they are not supposed to go back and, and think of their past or go back to the way uh, things used to be and you know, consider 
uh, you know, what they have in the past, their lives in the past, as having value, having advantage for the life of faith. And Paul, Paul will use his own example, right? He said he had a pedigree, he had a background, you know, but, you know, they are worthless. Rubbish, he calls them, right? Useless, of no value. It doesn't add any value to the life of faith. And I want to say also that Paul is not just talking about the good things in life, like our education, our achievements, you know, our social standing. He's also talking about the bad ones, you know, like the past relationships, you know, the failures, temptations, you know, the wounds we carry in our hearts, right? The emotional wounds, the spiritual wounds, like anger, bitterness, you know, we've been hurt by others, we've been betrayed by those nearest to us. And forgiveness is a very hard thing to do. Or perhaps we carry guilt, shame. Or sometimes it's not people wrong us, it's we are the ones that have wronged others, right? And then there's regret. You know, the big decisions in life, you know, that you know turn out in the end to be wrong, like studies, career choices, who to marry, right? And these things of old. Uh, if we don't deal with them, it can keep us chained in the past. It can keep us pressed down, right? Keep us obsessing over what we should have done, uh, what we should not have done. You know the the what if question. You know the only if. You know or only if I said yes to this job. You know only. You know or, or what if I married this person? You know you know the kind of questions that you keep playing in our case. You know. And ultimately, these things are not good. These are distractions. Right, they distract us from following God. Right, they hinder uh, the work that God has started in our lives, and you know they may even cripple our future. And Paul, I think he will understand this need to move beyond our past. Right, before he was Paul, he saw right, saw the destroyer of churches, and you know he had blood on his hands. Yes, he had God's forgiveness. Jesus' blood atoned for his sins. But he knew what he did. He had not forgotten the violence that he inflicted upon the church. Not just if you look at the Philippians, and just go back a couple of verses to verses 5, 5, 6, right? Yeah, you notice, yeah, he talks about his, you know, the pedigree, the good things here. But then look at this, as, this phrase huh, where he, he's referring to his past. And he's a, a persecutor, a zealous persecutor of the church. And there are other texts, you know, uh, other in, in other letters. He, uh, I'll just go through, I won't, I won't go through uh, in depth like that. In Timothy, you know, it's, he says he's this violent persecutor, aggressor in Galatians. So he persecuted the church, you know, beyond measure, you know, tried to destroy it. And in the first Corinthians chapter 15, you know, um, you know, we sense if you read the text, uh, it sense that. He's a bit remorseful over what they had done. You know, not fit to be called to service, not fit to be an apostle, you know, having persecuted the church. And of course, in the book of Acts, uh, you can just take this now, I won't go through, right? We, we see, you know, it gives us this picture of Paul's former way of life, and we see that it's driven by death and violence and hostility, right? Now, the point I'm trying to make is this Paul did not whitewash what he did. No, he did not suppress them from memory, like maybe some of us do, you know, the bad things, or we just don't remember them, pretend it didn't happen. Paul did not do that. He knew full well what he did. But here, what he says in verse 13, forget past, forget what's behind. You know, don't, don't look to the past, don't let the past define you. In fact, don't live your life backwards. I'm sure you all know, right, that the human life is designed, is made to be lived forward, not backward. And we see this in nature, right? We see this in the, you know, the fish in the sea. They don't swim backwards. They swim forward, right? Birds in the air, they don't fly backward. They fly forward, and sometimes in beautiful formation. And animals that move on the ground do so in a forward direction. Now, of course, some animals, uh, I'm sure you know, some animals can move backward or side sideways now, but it's not natural behavior. And likewise for, for man, mankind, right? we, we are not designed to walk backward or sideways. We can, we can try walking backwards out of church after and you know, after service, but we find it's not natural, right? Because our legs are not designed in that way. You know, our eyes are located in front, not at the back, or not at the side also, right? Fishes too. 
And you know, the point is our body, our physicality is not designed for backward living, but forward living. You know, there was this one time when I hit a car, and then I was, uh, okay, I was 10 years old, huh? so I was not driving, I was 10 years old, and I hit a car, okay? True story, it happened in school. Um, what happened was the car was uh, reversing very slowly, right? And I was walking, but I was not looking forward. My body was walking straight, but my head is like, turn, turn, to, the, turn to the back or sideways or somewhere, I don't know for what reason, maybe to look at something or someone, I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and so, I, my friend, I walked right into the cars behind uh, the bumper. You know. uh, thank God, it was a uh, car was slowly reversing, and I didn't get knocked down. You know, I didn't even see the driver. Who's the driver? Male or female? I don't know. Because I quickly got up and I, I left the scene. You know, there's uh, there's no injury done to my person uh, except my pride and ego, you know, so That's why I left quickly. Right? Uh, the point is simply this, right? Uh, don't live backward. <laughs> uh, don't even look backward and trying to live forward, right? Remember uh, Lot's wife in Genesis, right? She was walking away forward, then she turned back and was and became a pillar of salt. Uh, if not, then remember my story. I look back and I hit the car, not the car hit me. And friends, uh, you know this this thing about living forward, uh, it's not some mumbo jumbo feel good philosophy, right? it's actually biblical. Because God Himself lives in this way. God doesn't rehash what went wrong in the beginning. Of course, He knows what happened in the beginning, yeah? in the Garden of Eden. He doesn't forget. And when we read the Bible saying that He forgets our sins, uh, it's not in the sense He, uh, you know, like suppresses them, right? no, it's in the sense that He chooses not to remember them. He chooses not to remember our sins. He chooses not to go there, dwell there, you know, and then bring them up again to remind us, you know, you know, to use against us. But instead what he does, he constantly reminds us, you know, in, in the Bible, you read the Bible, don't dwell in the past. There's nothing there. Let's move forward, let's move ahead. And here's one reminder, Isaiah 43, right? Beautiful reminder spoken to the Israelites in their, in their lowest point in history. He says, right, remember not the former things, nor consider things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, or make a reverse in the desert. Very similar to what Paul is saying, isn't it, verse 13. Yeah? Perhaps Paul is drawing from this text. I want to draw us our attention to what God is saying here. You know, he's, he's saying this, I will make a way. I will make a way. God has made a way for us, isn't it, friends? Right? He sent his son Jesus. Christ came, gave his life on the cross. And because of what he has done, you know, we, we can find peace, we can find forgiveness of our past sins and temptations and all the bad things that either happened to us or that we have, you know, have done to others, right? And, and with his help, we can do so. With his help, we can do so. We can make peace with our past, yeah, with the Lord's help. In fact, you know what, friends? We will never be able to make peace with our past huh? until we make peace with God first, until we receive His forgiveness of sins, until we receive His Holy Spirit. That's the help that God gives us. And, it, and so it is not by our own strength, but through Christ in us, by the gift of peace and forgiveness, that can enable us to make peace with our past. Friends, have you discovered this gift of peace and forgiveness? And have you brought your past life, your sins, regrets, wounds to the cross? It doesn't matter how long or how short our past is, right? we can find freedom, we can find healing, the lost relationship, the missed opportunity, you know, the addiction, the poor choices, the poor life's choices, you know. We can bring them to the cross and God can take them all and can redeem them, we can redeem them you know, for our good. And if we somehow, you know, the offenders, you know, then we do our part. Huh? We ask for forgiveness from those we have hurt, those we have offended. You know, they may or may not respond, but that's okay. We do our part and 
you know, we leave the rest to God. Only, you know, that we, we learn from our past, right? We learn not to make the same old mistakes again. No, we learn to make new ones, lah, you know, as uh, one of the one preachers said. I remember, right? Don't make the same old mistake, make new ones. So, forgetting what is behind means you take what is good, we learn from our experience, and we leave the rest where they are in the past, and we move forward. We trust God with our life. We accept that whatever had happened and will happen is His will for us. Let me press on to my second point. And Paul says this in verse 13, right, too, that he's, he's pressing on. And the word press on is not a passive word. It's not a, a word, a picture word of resting, sitting around doing nothing, you know, waiting for things to happen. It's an active word for living in the present, not giving up, but persevering. Or, you know, as I, as I say this, you know, being good stewards, of the life we still have. And we need to be good stewards of the life that's you know, given to us because uh, our life is not our own. Our life is a gift from God. We don't own it. God owns it and one day we have to give it back to Him and we have to account to Him for how we live our lives. And So the question, how shall we be good stewards of the life we still have in the present? A very pertinent questions for people in the third age because you know there's, there's this is realization with only so many years remaining. Now my my first job after uni was with an NGO called okay wait uh, called the National Council of Senior Citizens Organizations Malaysia. Okay, it's a mouthful I know. <laughs> National Council of Senior Citizens Organizations Malaysia. I just know that this NGO is a local NGO and it champions the rights and well-being of older people in the country. You know, it, it brings together all the senior citizens clubs and associations in uh, Peninsular Malaysia. You know, it, the voice for the seniors. Huh? Now, my boss, guess how old he was? He was 88 years old. Considered very old age, huh? <laughs> Uh, he's a Methodist Christian, you know, I think he's a member of K.L. Wesley. Um, and he's very, he was very involved in union works. Uh, yeah, in fact, he founded the National Union of Teachers in the 50s. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and of course, in the later years, he founded this uh, NGO. He's a founding president. And he's 88 when I started working with him, for him. And you know, at 88, uh, he could still drive to work. You know, he could walk properly without cane, you know. He could eat a plate of chakwetel and, you know, just fall up. And his mind is still alert. His wit still sharp. You know, he can hold conversations with uh, government official, officials, you know, the higher ups, you know, people in, in uh, the leaders of the industries. And, you know, his positive outlook on, on life, uh, I think, put, put the young to shame, uh, can put the young to shame. And I was in my mid-twenties, huh? and so, He's nearly what, three, four times my age and still going strong. <coughs> so one day uh, I, I, I sat down in his office and I asked him, uh, Mr. Lam, his name is uh, Lam Kinta, I call him Mr. Lam. Mr. Lam, uh, what's your secret? <laughs> and I remember what he, uh, I remember he, what he told me, uh, it's very simple, uh, stay active, stay active. In fact, uh, he will also say this on other occasions to other people that you know that you, know, you think you're old, uh, then you will restrict yourself, right? And so, you know, you have to keep active, stay active, you know, learn something new every day, do something new every day. That's my boss, my first boss after uni. Uh, when, um, he got his datoship later in, in, in his age, la, and he went on to, he lived to be his, to, to mid-90s, you know that, you know, past mid-90s, and, and then he went home to the Lord. Uh, and he got his Dato Sheep quite late in, in life, so that's why I call him Mr. Lam, not, not Dato Lam. And, and of course, uh, he's, he's not uh, just the only one who lives this exemplary life. There are many others, uh, senior who didn't retire, 
who didn't just decline into OH, you know, but they remain actively involved with life, with people, you know, with society, you know, and you know, they, they refute this myth uh, that aging is bad, right? That old means uh, over the hill, time to step aside, right? But old does not mean obsolete. You, know, you may be old, but you're not obsolete, not yet. Not while you straw, draw breath, and you know, God is not done uh, with us yet. Now, of course, some seniors uh, will have health issues, uh, right? But a good majority will be uh, relatively healthy, you know, thanks to better health care, and many can still contribute significantly. Just a uh, question, uh, do you know who's the oldest uh, uh, oldest athlete to compete in the 2024 Olympics. You, anyone you know? Uh, don't follow Olympics. Huh? Yeah, I mean, the opening wasn't great. Lah. I mean, let's leave that behind. <laughs> Focus on the good. Now, the oldest athlete in the 2024 Paris Olymp Olympics huh, is a 65 year old equestrian from Spain. And um, I also got to find out, uh, this year, find out this year, you know, that. We have, Malaysia has a, no potentially the world's oldest medical graduate. A 71-year-old uh, grandfather retiree, you know, from Port Dixon. He's retired now, la. I'm not sure if he's still he's practicing, but he became the world's oldest medical graduate this year, actually, sometime in July, uh, graduated from a university in Philippines. So uh, certainly he's the university oldest graduate, uh, 71 years old. And then I also read uh, just recently, like in September, you know, the 78-year-old Cambridge professor was ordained a Catholic priest, 78 years old, well past the retirement age you know, for a parish priest. And of course, let's not forget our dear sister Faith, right? I won't, put, I won't mention her, dear, her, her age, uh, we shouldn't ask women age, right? we should ask her birthday, right? Not the age, right? Uh, okay, and well, some of you will know, right? She went to the seminary and she did a master in biblical interpretation, right? And she was the oldest student in the class, and she was the best student. Now, I'm not saying that to you all to you know, go and you know, take up competitive sports and you know, go to seminary. Huh? I know your limit, but the thing is, don't limit God in what he can do in you, in your lives, right? It's not done with us yet. He can do with our remaining time, you know, what he did with loaves and fish, multiply them, and to bless many. And we can see examples, not just real, real world examples, but also examples in the Bible. Abraham, at the age of 75, right, was called to be a well, pioneer explorer, to go to somewhere he's never been before, 75 years old. And Moses, an 80-year-old 80 human rights fighter, sent to deliver his people from oppression. And Paul, right, aged man, 50-60s, theological, theological educator, writer of epistles, you know, itinerant preacher of grace, like a Methodist preacher, the itinerant, uh, traveling extensively to, to minister to God's people. There are many more in the, in the Bible, uh, the MSF, Anniversary, uh, Reverend Dr. Lu talks about Ages Simeon, who kept this vision of his dreams alive and he, he was blessed with seeing Jesus uh, in the person of, uh, seeing God in the person of the baby Jesus. And so each one of them, you know, in the Bible, you know, we see that they are called to give their lives to something that matters, something that's bigger than themselves. And I think that's something we need to do too. We need to apply ourselves to purpose, purposeful work, even for the seniors. Otherwise, it's a sure death. You know, the mind will be the first to die before the body. And I think the seniors, they have a unique opportunity and you know, a unique time and that, that unique stage of life to do more than when they were younger, right? You know, people, when they were young, the, the, the students will be thinking about the studies, you know, right? working adults, you know, finding job, uh, creating relationships, and you know, maybe young parents, you know, just thinking about raising families and uh, you know the marriage. 
But the seniors, eh? well, they have already invested in all these things. You know, in the, in the studies and work and family, you know, uh, they are free from this duty and obligation of parenting even. And, which means that you know, they have uh, less ties to these things that can you know, occupy them. You know, and they have more time because you know, right, they live longer. Right? And so the question is, you know, what might God be calling us, seniors, to give our time to serve you know, in the many areas of need in the here and now? You know, what will you do with the remaining years of life that you still have? It doesn't have to be in the church. Right? It can be outside the church engaging the world as salt and light. But of course, uh, churches uh, do have all sorts of needs and, and concerns uh, and could, could do well uh, with the help of the seniors, the third ages, right? Their gifts, their uh, resources, their skills and life experience can be channeled to uh, grow the church, build up the church. Now, what are some areas that might be considered or seniors involvement, it's not tokenistic, but you know, that's meaningful, you know. Perhaps it's connecting with the younger generation, the children, the youth. And we know that churches today, you know, they're trying to reach the Gen Z, the Gen Alpha, the young families, and our Wesley Penang is no different. Huh? We're also trying to do that, huh? trying to draw the young ones to our community. And I think our team of uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, they will love to have more mature Christians helping with the work, talking to kids about God, about his kingdom, you know, telling stories about Jesus. I think some of you would uh, remember Dato Ki, right? Dato Ki Pekchin. I only got to know her briefly uh, while I was a Sunday school, when I was a Sunday school uh, superintendent, and I found that she's a wonderful storyteller. You know? uh, she, one time she asked me, you know, uh, what Bible to get so that she can tell stories to her grandchild. And she I think she would be a wonderful asset to the children ministry, but uh, sadly, uh, God took her home. Now. And perhaps it's not children ministry, it could be the youth, you know. The youth today, you know, they're looking for mentors and role models. And, you know, who can come alongside them, pray alongside them, you know, hear their struggles, hear their stories, help them find answers to the meaning of life. And what about the senior ministry themselves? Can the senior ministry be more than just keeping one another occupied and healthy, you know. Then would it be amazing uh, to see seniors mobilized as an army for the Lord, right? a silent army of seniors, modern seniors, modern elders with a sense of purpose and mission, empowered to live prophetically, to reach out to their fellow seniors. But what if some of us, you know, say we don't have it anymore? We you know nothing. You don't have it anymore to give, right? To partner with God to participate in His work. You no know, right? The body can't keep up. The mind not that sharp, you know. Well, I will say this: uh, pursue God, because the later stage of life, you know, may be the best time to reaffirm your relationship with God. Right? This is also being good stewards of the life that we still have. You know, we tell children and youth, you know, they have to own their faith. They can't borrow their parents' faith. I think the same can be said to the seniors. You know, own your faith. And if you haven't started to own your faith, you know, start now. Never mind the past. Paul says forget the past, right? Go to the cross, reaffirm your faith, renew your commitment, and walk with Him. And it doesn't matter, baby steps, uh, it's still walking with Him. Uh, God doesn't see the number of steps, uh, you know, our spiritual mileage. He sees the heart the willingness to still walk that extra mile. So yes, you know, pursue God, right? Make time to meet Him, commune with Him, don't neglect His worship, don't neglect meeting together, and don't neglect His Word. But take in the Word, soak in His Word. Let His Word transform your mind, giving you that hope and confidence, you know, so that if not, I don't ask you, you are ready to give hope. You are ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope you have in Christ. Let me move on to my third uh, point, looking ahead. How many of you enjoy driving home, uh, driving long distance? I do, right? especially driving back home to Sremban. It's a six hour drive, and, um, but to me, it's okay. It's tiring, yes. But you know what kept me 
on the road was, the, was this anticipation of what's, what lies at the end of the journey. The reunion with my mother, with my siblings, playtime with my nieces, you know. All this, this, this looking forward, this expectation, this anticipation, it made that six hour road trip and nothing. You know, it makes it even worthwhile. It's this not for long distance driving also. I think it's applicable to you know, other areas of life. Like, you know, going, going home, looking forward to go home after a long day at work, right? Or maybe looking ahead to lunch after this sermon, you know, thinking what to eat. Okay, maybe breakfast, uh, brunch, not lunch, right? So the question is, what gives you reason to press on, to not look back, but look ahead? And Paul says it's this anticipation of our next chapter in life. And by this, I'm talking about death. I'm talking about death, uh, something we don't hear often in church service, except maybe wake or funeral services. But death is the destiny of everyone, young and old. And we all have the same boarding pass. We all wait in line until the boarding call. Uh, and then it's time for us to take flight to a world that is invisible. And for some, this can be difficult to accept, especially if they don't come to terms with their lives. Right? And death is something to be feared. Right? Death means the end of existence, the end of meaning, of relationships. Death leads to nothingness. But is that what the Bible says? No, the Bible says, you know, at the end of death, beyond death, at the end of life, it's not nothingness, it's not emptiness. Huh? It's the Father's house. And no one has seen or heard what this place looks like, and that's by design, but we get hints of it in the, in the Bible, right? It's a place of welcome. It's a place to settle down and, and dwell in perfect peace and security. No more pain, no more hostility, no more life's wound and struggles with sin. It's also a place of reunion, restored fellowship with those who have gone ahead. And of course, in other parts of the Bible, it talks about, you know, change and transformation of our lowly bodies. So death is not, you know, for the Christian, death is not the end of meaning of life, but the continuation of life and purpose, you know, an invitation to an eternal future with God. And, and this future with God, this heavenly call, is what kept Paul pressing on. He knew he was going to die. He's not afraid. He's come to terms with his past. He saw what God could do, and he anticipated what's in store. And then he looked forward to the resurrection of his body, to meeting his Savior face to face, and all that. And he said, yeah, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So we do not have to fear death. Huh? Those of us who may be struggling with death, right? Christ has conquered death, and death does not have the last say. It's not the end of life. It's the start of a new one. It's an invitation to a future with God. It's a glorious future. No, we're not going to be angels huh? sitting and then just playing harps in the clouds a little lower than God. We're going to be His children, members of His household. And Christ is our brother, our big brother. And we're going to be that sign to the principalities and powers in the heavenly realms that, that God is most wise in this act to seek and save the lost. And so with this, you know, we can press on. We have a purpose to live in the present. We can press on, persevere, do His will, serve the Lord, and when the time comes, we trust the Lord and we go. Being confident in this wonderful promise that nothing, nothing can and nothing shall separate us from the love that is in Christ, the love of God that will not let us go. Let me end with a story uh, about uh, a story about husband and wife, you know, made for each other. And they had everything good, right? Except they made a mistake, an act of hubris, thinking they can handle the situation, but they did not handle it well. And in fact, what they did ended up destroying everything. And the man and the woman, you know, they try to hide their shame. They try to shift the blame. But 
it was futile. They had to bear the consequence. They had to move. They had to leave. And they had to start somewhere. And it's a terrible mistake that not only affected their children, but also their children's children. And all of mankind have seen struggle with sins, with the presence of sins. And I wonder whether late at night, you know, out there in the wild, away from the Garden of Eden, alone in their thoughts, whether the man and woman, you know, they carried deep regret for what happened, for what they've done. The scripture doesn't say, but it does tell us that Adam and Eve, they went on to live their lives. Yet not on their own strength, but with God's help. For the Lord was with them. He was with them when they left Eden, and He has never left them since. And when the woman gave birth to a newborn, she gave thanks to God for this great sign of hope, saying, I have brought forth a son with the Lord's help. And with the Lord's help, they live a lifetime. The man, nearly a millennium. And then they went home to be with their maker, the ancient of days who did not dwell on what they had done, but made a way for things to be set right. And for that, friends, we can live fully, we can live forward. It doesn't matter what life has dealt us or where life will take us, one thing is true. Now God is with us every moment of our life on earth and with His help, we can live each day with peace, with purpose, with a sense of destiny until the day we enter His presence and we meet our Saviour, the one who loves us eternally. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Your word reminds us, Lord, of why it is just so wonderful to know you, to have this eternal life, this, this promise of fullness of life from you. And Father, we want to give you thanks for the sinners in our community, for your faithfulness to them, and that, Lord, the promise of fullness of life is for them too. And so, God, I pray that you help us, especially the seniors, Lord, to you know, live their lives more fully, making peace with their past, being good stewards of the life they still have, and having this anticipation of the eternity. And so God then teaches us to run with endurance the race you have set before us. Help our eyes fix on Jesus, the one who initiates and perfects our faith, so that when we return to you one day, we can give a good account of how we have lived our lives here on earth, glorifying you, serving others, and becoming more like Jesus with each passing day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.